did intensive interaction start and then from there how did it develop and how did you carry out the development of it as practice yeah uh, a, a long and involved story and I'll, I'll try and I'll, <laughs> I'll try and Sorry. keep this down no we it's good to we want to put this um, put this in the video as well don't we um, and it goes back a long way as well we're going back to 1981 um, and Harper Bree Hospital School which was um, a special school uh, on the campus of an old style long stay hospital you know an, an institution um, it's in was in Hertfordshire in St Albans and uh, I went to the school on the campus as the deputy head teacher first in 1981 uh, tough place um, Harper Bree was a very large long stay hospital I think there about a thousand people living there when I first went went to work there uh, and the school was not part of the hospital it was an educational authority school but but placed on the campus uh, for the children of the hospital but by 82 83 time national policy was was to no longer admit children to those institutions which was probably the right thing to do <laughs> <laughs> and um, so in fact, the school became a, an unofficial FE college. With students who were in their late teens, 20s, 30s, and a school building that was crummy then. If you see photos of it derelict now, even so, I think you realise it was not a good building. The, the people we were working with covered the spectrum of learning disability and autism. We had people with all the usual descriptions and diagnoses, in, including people with profound and multiple learning difficulties. But the the greater proportion of our students were pretty highly active, usually phys physically active adult people. Probably more than fifty percent of them with diagnosis of autism or something like, and a very large number of them, again, probably seventy percent of them, people capable, adult people capable of the most severely challenging behaviour. That was that was usually why they'd ended up in the hospital. They, you know, gravitated down through the system. And, um, and it, was, you, 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 it was a sort of school where you had to really want to work. <laughs> you really had to be into to doing that work. And, and it was the second school of, of that type that I'd worked at. And uh, it, it was the staff team, really, that, that kicked things off. When I, They're already, a lot of them, not all of them, but a lot of them were quite thoughtful practitioners of a kind that I hadn't previously met. So they, they would sit in the staff room and have technical discussions at, at lunchtime over your Tupperware boxes, you know. And um, and the, the discussions were focusing a lot on what we did, and 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 they were very honestly focusing on the reality of of actually how little we knew about what we were trying to do. There was a desire amongst not all, but amongst a good proportion of the staff, in, including me, to move on and do something different, because we were very dual practitioners. We were a blooming serious, grim-faced lot actually in our work at that time, because uh, most of what we were using were behavioural principles, behaviour modification, mm -hmm. approaches based on Skinnerite principles. Um, and I wasn't comfortable with that, and quite a few of the others were, but, but <laughs> we didn't know what else to do, you know. And a discussion p particularly focused on the communication curriculum. We could, we could recognise that was the, easily the priority for most of our students. Sorry, let me correct that, all of our students. Mm. Um, and yet what we knew about helping people to learn to be communicators was, was like that much. And, and so we, we started discussing that in detail and we, we got a little bit scholarly actually because I, I can recall there was a period when we thought, well, somebody must have written a book on this, you know, <laughs> we'll go and read the book. And it, it took us a while, I think, to acknowledge that probably, probably that book doesn't exist. And then we just, we, we started on this very haphazard process of experimenting. Um, as we, This is as we're moving into 82, experimenting with our practices. But the, the thing that we did at that time that was really useful and, and set the, the basic groundwork for everything that was going to come later was, even though we were still technically unaccomplished, we, we, we did start to lighten up and loosen up. We recognised that we wanted to do that. We we somehow kind of recognise that learning to be a communicator is an informal mm. uh, kind of activity that it's, it's, it should be relaxed and enjoyable. And we started lightening up and, and lightening up the environment. We start, I remember a period we went through getting, getting sofas and armchairs and things into the classrooms and, and previously it had been a very kind of lino and gloss paint and formica kind mm. of environment and we realised now that it, we're working with adults but, but 
th th there was maybe even a sense where we, we started to have adult playrooms in the mm -hmm. classrooms. Um, and we were, we're bumbling along like that. <laughs> uh, we, we were kind of methodical, we were keeping notes and, um, and, and, and having evaluation meetings. I've still got the notes. <laughs> Um, yeah, we called it. We, a folder. I've got a folder called ACE, ACE, Appropriate Communication Environment. That was what we were thinking. I quite like that still, Appropriate mm -hmm. Communication Environment. Yeah. Um, but the key thing that really kicked us off happened in, I think it was January, very dark night in January '83. A couple of us went to a local teachers' centre to have a meeting with Geraint Ephraim, who was a psychologist working at another hospital about 10 miles away. And being a psychologist, he was he was he was learned and academic, you know, and he he'd been reading the stuff that was just coming out of the states, the parent infant interaction literature, and he'd kind of gone dong ha ha, and made the association. And with staff at uh, Leavesden Hospital where he worked, he was working on the use of imitation um, with people with autism. And uh, the key thing that he said to us was, yeah, experiment, great, yeah, experiment, yeah, but have a think about it. You don't you don't really need to invent something new, do you? Have a look at how we all learn those things that that one works it's powerful um and so yeah we we started following what he'd done and look at we i remember it was a bit of a shock actually I, at the time I, I i hadn't done it previously but to actually read research literature <laughs> <laughs> that was that was what we started doing and um looking at the principles of parent infant interaction of course making the association and having having that knowledge feed into our experimentation the other key thing we did that year, 83, was buy the very first camcorder that became available. Was, that was when you could buy them, I think, around about 82, 83, when they first got in the shops. And of course, they were, they were huge, huge, great big things. But, but we'd fantasised with our experiments about having a, a video to watch it back. And, and of course, those first camcorders were really cool. And they were a good picture, full-size VHS cassette. Did you have that? It was, must have been the same those. in the States. Yeah, though, I remember those. A, what, were the, what, what was the system in the States? But a big cassette mm -hmm. in the camera, yeah. <laughs> um, and that was great and some of the happiest times in my working life were those evaluation meetings watching videos together with the team mm -hmm. at Harperbury another key thing was 85 Melanie Nind coming to the school she'd come straight from college and she's one of those one of those people where you, you only have to be with her for a few minutes and you think she's got something different going on <laughs> 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 and uh, she was, she, she was ex uh, clearly extraordinarily intelligent and and in fact, we were, we were lucky to get her. I think every special school in the area was trying to get her because she was at local teacher's college. She came to the school 21, a probationary teacher, brain the size of a planet, but she brought the academic cutting edge. She, she brought that final dimension to what we we're doing. And, um, and by 80, 85, 86, we started to feel like we, we understood this working model that we're calling intensive interaction. And... Um, and it had been a whole team development process, but me and Melanie became the, if you like, the writers. We, we, uh, we started writing articles for journals and magazines, and people started phoning us up and asking us to go to conferences and give training days. We 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 felt like yeah, it's great, it's working. We're getting some really lovely results with people where we'd never had these results before. I, well, not to put too fine a point on it, I, I guess we were sort of enthralled. Um, people who had formerly been what what you would call really difficult to reach, really difficult to reach, um, and living perhaps in their own world of social isolation, we we're, were able to make access to them and, and, and them to us and have this, have this sensation that we lit them up, they, they, were, they, they were lit up by the, by the whole experience of, of learning to interact and be with other people, they, they, they came to life and and started making progress and 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 wanting to be with us where formerly they they maybe wanted to be in their own world of social isolation and rhythmic repetitive behaviors and and then also the the students who were already a bit further on than that who weren't so much socially isolated but nonetheless still at early stages of development as communicators so they also lit up more and and were making more progress and and we had the sensation of creating activities with this uh, this forward momentum with them and we could we could see them developing um, 
and then also for many of them that that development it, it branched out um you know it, it makes sense doesn't it that the that making progress with being a communicator is going to have knock-on effects and and they could start to make progress in other areas in in, in other areas of learning we did think well do do, other, do people out there know about it we wanted to share it that got out of hand then people we were getting too many requests we couldn't service everybody that's, that's still the case um and and mel really was the, the the mover in this because she she kept on making the point look we, if we're going to do this and keep going out and saying you know hey people try this this is good we've got a responsibility which is prove it do the do the basic demonstration of you know research-based practice so she and I both registered to do research projects to do PhDs and we had the PhD projects running in our school for two years as part of the life of the school I don't think you could do that now mm -hmm. uh, I don't think so could you probably not um, with, with the whole staff team involved really everybody mostly I think enjoyably taking part in this <laughs> I, don't, I wouldn't want to ever go through that again. It was hard work, but we got we got through it, and uh, and subsequent to that, in as we moved into the nineties, uh, uh, we we started writing our books based on based on all of our work, and then there's been a been a gradual development in the dissemination of intentions for action ever since. Mm -hmm.